Well, I have to say this marks a first in the history of the Big Impact. Never before have we reached out to guests live in Italy. But that is what we are doing today as we uh, touch base with Sarah and Craig Farner, who have been stuck in Italy for quite some time here during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, not only because of Craig's military service, but because Italy is pretty much on a, a version of lockdown that we have not seen here in America and really hope we don't see. But uh, they're from my home state of Michigan. I know that many of you who listen to The Big Impact are located in different parts of the country. Uh, but for those of you who call the, the mitten your home, I, I see right now as I'm looking on Skype at, at uh, Craig's shirt, he's got a Detroit Lions hoodie on as if Lions fans haven't suffered enough. But it's... <laughs> It is, uh, it's so good to see you guys, and um, how are you? We are doing very well. We are very grateful for our health, the health of our friends so far. We are praying for those affected by this terrible virus, but us as a family unit are doing wonderful. So the, fam- sure. the family unit, walk us through who all is in this apartment you, you are uh, now calling home 24-7. So my husband and I, Craig, have been married for over 10 years, and we have a son, Lucius, who just turned nine. Unfortunately, his birthday was during the lockdown. We were planning possibly a sleepover with friends, so that's been a little rough on him. He's in third grade, and our daughter, Myla, is five and a half in kindergarten. Wow. And Craig, what was it that originally took your family to Italy? Why are you there in the first place? So I'm with the United States Air Force and uh, got an assignment over to Italy. Of course, you're thinking, oh, it's going to be great. You're going to do a whole bunch of travel. Uh, we're going to get to see a whole bunch of stuff. We started doing that a little bit, and then here we are, no travel. <laughs> what, is, what is your role with the Air Force? Uh, kind of complicated to explain. Um, one Charlie 5, which is a command and control battle management operator. So we control the battle space in the air uh, for anything from air support, air refueling, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, uh, over a number of dish- different mission sets. Okay, so like you said, complicated, but something that's been years in the making. You don't just stumble into that position in the Air Force. You had to work hard to get to that point. How For how sure. many years have you been in the Air Force? So actually, I hit 16 years today. So it's today. Been, been quite a while. <laughs> Happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. I hadn't thought about that. I'm sure they'll throw a big party for you at headquarters, even though you can't attend. Uh, Right, right. (laughs) Well, before we get into the story of what it's like to be in Italy right now, can can you kind of take us back to, uh, Craig, in your world, what fueled your interest, your desire to be in the Air Force to begin with? Why did this matter to you? Absolutely. So really, it began with, you know, a, a duty to the country. So I wanted to serve... Uh, my father served, my grandfather served, uh, made perfect sense. I didn't think that I would be in uh, as a lifer. I was like, I'm going to give this four years, go see where it takes me. And at the end of the day, uh, it was a good gig. Uh, I enjoyed it, and it made sense to continue on. Did you ever uh, dream of being overseas, or are you just all, all throughout these 16 years, you, obviously you're going where they send you, but did you ever think, I'm going right. to see the world someday? Uh, initially, that's not what I thought when I first began, but soon after joining, uh, I was continually going different places, uh, whether it was for training or for assignments, and absolutely, you know, that's an exciting part of what we do. Yeah. At some point, I certainly don't know when it was, but at some point, you laid eyes on this young lady sitting next to you on the couch, and uh, how did the two of you meet? That's a, that's a, a really interesting story. So a long time ago, before I joined the military, I was into acting. So I uh, went out to Hollywood, and I ended up uh, working on a movie and uh, kind of producing on a movie called A Christmas Too Many. Had uh, Gary Coleman, Mickey Rooney, uh, (laughs) all kinds. Wait wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This story has just taken a direction that I never <laughs> saw it taking. You you have right, now right. injected into a conversation about an Air Force family quarantined in Italy. You have just injected the name Gary Coleman. I, I did yes. not see this coming. <laughs> yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So I actually had uh, two friends, Stephen Wallace, 
uh, and Kevin Cronin, Kevin Michaels, that I, I got together to work on this project, and she was a fan of Austin O'Brien, and actually on his fan page as we we're working through this movie, I say that she saw me, she says I saw her, either which way we made a connection, uh, because we're from the same area in Michigan, and kind of started talking online. Uh, she wouldn't give me her phone number for about three, four years, but at the end of the day, she finally did give me uh, her phone number right before my first deployment. And uh, ever since then, we were together. He said God was working on him during those few years. So, <laughs> Okay, so Sarah, w just between the three of us and everybody who's watching and listening, did you fall for the, the Hollywood version of, of Craig, or did you fall for the future Air Force version? Or what did, what did you see in this guy? The main thing was that uh, he shared my faith, which was very important for me and looking for a husband. So us both sharing the same faith was the clincher for me. And of course, his wonderful heart. Yeah, that's awesome. How did you discover at the at those early stages? I know this is veering off, by the way, of our primary conversation topic, but I find this <laughs> fascinating. Right. I find it fascinating. And I also happen to host a podcast called the big uh, called Marriage Talk which is, okay. you can maybe see a logo behind me on the, on the yes, wall here. Do. And so yeah. I'm always interested in how people get together. Yeah. How did you discover the shared faith values? Was it a direct conversation or were you just kind of watching to see how he behaved? Oh, pretty direct. I, want, I wanted to know, you know, so yeah, pretty direct. But do you remember? In fact, yeah. when we first... Go ahead. Oh, sorry, when we first started uh, interchanging letters before we actually met because she didn't want to just, you know, meet up. It was actually uh, through somebody else in her church so that I wouldn't know her address. <laughs> very careful. Very good. Yeah. Um, so, Sarah, do you remember yeah. the first words Craig ever said to you? It was on a voicemail, and he was begging for my phone number, and he said, I'm about to deploy. I would love to hear your voice before I leave. Please call me. Through instant messenger, you No, mean? through a voicemail, his actual, no. Wow. So. Wait, no, that wouldn't make sense. It must yeah. have been through instant messenger audio or something, because like, he didn't have my phone number. No, I think I gave him my phone number, <clears throat> didn't want to answer the phone, because I was like, super, I'm super introverted and shy. So he left me a voicemail <laughs> once he finally had my phone number, and that's when I first heard his voice saying, I deploy tomorrow. Can you call me back so we can say hello or goodbye, whatever? Craig, I got to tell you, yeah. I mean, that's that's got to be the oldest trick in the book. You know, the old, <laughs> hey, baby, I, I'm sailing away tomorrow. I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever see you again. I mean, that's pretty good. That's right. pretty, pretty inventive on your part. It was part. actually true, so, you yeah, know. Yeah, that was true. <laughs> so it worked out. the next day, yeah. So, so when, the, when the assignment came, eventually, after you've been together and you've started your family and the assignment came to go to Italy, was there ever a thought that Craig would go there by himself or was it always going to be, we're all going? Um, at first, we've lived in three countries, so the United States, Canada, and Italy, and I don't want to call it a fear, but I guess it kind of was. I have a fear of flying, so flying over water, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if we should ever do that. And he, like you said, traveling the world, that was something he always wanted to do. But, you know, now that we're here, I said, oh, I, I could do it. We did it and we're living here. So I kind of always saw it on the back burner as a possibility. And we had a, a lot of time apart. So I did a yeah. whole year in Korea um, by myself, couldn't take the family. Yeah. So there was no question about whether or not we would join him in Italy. We knew we, knew we were going together. You arrived there when? It was January, January 24th. Of of um, last year. Yeah, 2019. Okay. Trying to remember what month and year we're in right now with this crazy lockdown. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. And, and at the same time, uh, before we get to the the, the post-COVID conversation, when yeah. you hit the ground and you start to you know, kind of create a home in Italy, I would have to think it was a fascinating culture to absorb. What, Sarah, what did you first think about this country that you now call home? Well, my dad is actually 100% Italian. He was born in the States, but, um, you know, getting off the plane and, you know, seeing Venice from the air, it's like, wow, we're really here, you know, and I have to be honest with you, it took me many, many months for the adjustment of the culture shock, you know, it was, uh, it was hard even traveling to see the beauty and things just because it's so 
so different, you know, and I was missing my family, of course, but finally here a year later, right before this virus struck, I was really starting to enjoy our travels and feeling more comfortable here. And it was broken up. So yeah, we got here, like we said, January of last year. And by April, uh, I was gone for seven months on deployment. So she actually went back to the States for a while and then came back once I returned from deployment. So there, she had the first few months here. It was broken up by that deployment. So, you know, definitely a lot of adjustments, especially for the kids. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the kids, you know, I've seen some pictures of them in the news stories that you've been a part of. So they're old enough to remember these things. This will be, for the rest of their lives, this will be oh, yeah. uh, what I would call cognitive age where they can tell the stories. I remember yeah. when yep. we packed up and we went on the long flight and we did this. And yeah. it's kind of one of those things, I think, that someday they will share with their own kids or maybe even grandkids. So, so yeah. um what was their initial reaction to you when you got off the plane in Italy and you said kids were home? Did it make sense to them? Yeah, they basically their whole lives have been, you know, we've been a military family unit. So they know that we will move several times. We have moved several times and they were actually super excited. I think my son slept 90 minutes on the whole overnight <laughs> flight, and my daughter slept, our daughter slept maybe 35. She slept when we were descending, getting ready to land, and then, um, yeah, that was, they're not good overnight travelers. I guess they're very excitable, and, you know, seeing the, the DVD screens on the airplane, and we had never been on a flight that long, but, yeah, once, once we got here, we were in the temporary living facility for a few weeks while we searched for a house, and they're very resilient. You know, we're very blessed with their personalities that they can adapt so well. Well, we're going to pick up the story from there when we continue with Sarah and Craig Farner. They are in Italy, and they're going to be in that apartment for a while, judging by what we see on the international news. We'll continue the conversation on the big impact after this. Our guests on The Big Impact are Sarah and Craig Farner from Michigan. Craig serves in the Air Force, and the two of them, plus two beautiful children, are in Italy, and they are uh, getting very well acquainted with the confines of a three-bedroom apartment uh, because my understanding uh, about what's happening in Italy regarding the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is that the, the lockdown or the shelter at home or whatever it's not just a mere recommendation. It is serious, hardcore policy there. Um, we'll have you share some of that with us in a moment, but can you kind of walk us through the timeline of when the coronavirus first became um, a public issue? Maybe it was in the news or people were discussing it there because I think it happened uh, quite, a bit for, or quite a bit earlier than it did here in America. Yeah, so uh, at the very beginning, uh, there were some cases showing up uh, in the Lombardy region, which has Milan uh, as a city in there, and people were just kind of watching to see what was going to happen. There were some cases, uh, it wasn't blown up yet, and then I believe it was the 26th of February, uh, after Venice had already had, you know, multiple weeks of the world-famous carnival, Carnivale, oh boy. Um, that there was a call out saying, hey, you know, there are some cases they think it's kind of blowing up. So they're trying to reach out to everybody who went to these carnivals or went to, you know, Milan in these certain time frames. <clears throat> and then uh, from there, we had made the decision uh, a couple days before they even closed down the schools to say, hey, we're going to go ahead and just play it safe. This seems like it's starting to, you know, rev up a little bit right. within a few days they shut down all the schools and it was kind of hour by hour and day by day as different decrees came down first they locked down uh, the lombardi and the veneto regions veneto has venice in it uh, and a number of obviously a number of other cities and so you couldn't go to or from those areas then they eventually on the 9th of march had a full lockdown in which you could only leave unless you had your three main reasons you know of necessity so there was something medical uh, that you had to go and do. Uh, there was food or authorized types of work. At that time, you could still go and exercise, but you had to carry these papers around that basically say, you are here going here for this reason, and the police would stop you, and they would take them from folks, and they'd actually call to see if you're going to a doctor, so right. on and so forth. So you, you, have to to take a, you have to take a sheet of paper that says I'm, uh, I'm going out for a walk with my kids, or is that not even an option? 
that's not allowed anymore. So it um, was at that time, okay. but that time, yeah. then what ended up happening is a lot of folks really weren't adhering to that. So you can't even go out to exercise anymore. You go out for those three reasons. And yes, uh, you carry a piece of paper. And if you get stopped, you fill it in saying, I am going here to here. I live here. Here's my phone number. Uh, and realistically, it makes sense, right? Um, each government is different. Uh, the, the government here, it's much easier for them to, to get a hold of, of things with what they have in place. Uh, so it made sense. Just like any human beings, you know, it takes a while for everyone to fully take it seriously, right? Well, here in the States, there were very strong recommendations put out and people were ignoring them. We saw crowded beaches in Florida. We, we saw uh, right. gatherings still right. taking place. In fact, last weekend there was a, an arrest of a ch of a pastor at a mega church in the Florida, uh, in Florida in Tampa area, uh, because they were still gathering against what at that time had become executive orders and shelter in place. Um, and, and one of the things that that I think we were learning, uh, maybe we knew this already, but one of the things that I think we're learning about people all over the world. I don't think it really matters if you're in America or if you're in Italy or if you're in China. We have a very difficult time coming to grips with reality when reality changes our world in a major way. I also think we're not very good about putting the, the health or the needs of other people first, right? So right. we might, I feel great, so why can't I go anywhere? Right. Well, there, there are a lot of reasons for that. So to continue your story, uh, Craig, um, as as the um, as the restrictions start to grow and the freedoms start to shrink, you've got some major family adjustments to make. I mean, I just watched on um, I don't even there was some some show uh, maybe John Oliver's commentary where he started playing clips and I thought they were doctored clips. I thought they were just making up little spoof things of Italian officials on television just screaming at the people like using profanity and screaming at the people to, you know, whatever, to change their behavior, to do this, to do, to do that, including one, one official was screaming about uh, people who still wanted to get their hair done. And his, his tagline from his address was, your casket will be closed. It doesn't matter what your hair looks like. And I was like, mm -hmm. man, these people are not messing around. So no, speak, speak to the, uh, if you would, speak to the public discourse that's taking place there because it's it's much more harsh than it is here. Right. So as of right now, a majority of people, vast majority, it's unity. Uh, so they've worked all through those phases as people are a little bit upset, like, hey, I want to do my own thing. And they're understanding it. And I think because it's hit so many people here uh, and everyone has seen how bad it is, you have hospitals that are literally saying, you are X age and you have these ex existing conditions, we're not going to give you a ventilator. We're not going to help you. Like literally there are set parameters that if you get too sick, that you're just going to die because they can't save everybody. Uh, the hospitals are overrun. Uh, so they're going to utilize their resources and uh, equipment to save those that have a better chance of living. And that's what they're trying to prevent in the United States. So absolutely, it's you know a serious place here. Um, so you have some some really deep conversations to be had, not only with each other, but with a couple of young kids, right? The concept of we're inside again today and um, no, we can't go to the park. No, we can't go sightseeing. We can't do these things. So what's what's it been like, Sarah, as a mom um, trying to relay kind of where things are in the real world with young people who, I mean, frankly, when any of us were that age, there was no real world. We just lived in our own fantasy. We were making forts. We were playing cowboys and Indians. We were doing all <laughs> sorts of things. And now I'm guessing, um, I, well, there might be some intricate fort building going on over the next few weeks. Yeah, definitely. We actually did a fort. And instead of an indoor fort, I said, why not an outdoor fort? So we got the kitchen chairs and we brought them into our backyard, got sheets and blankets and all of that. And, um, just a day or two ago, my husband set up a, um, a tent in the backyard for the kids to play in. So we're, we're becoming very creative. And when we see one of us is overwhelmed, the other one will sort of take over, you know, so the other one can have a break, especially with their online virtual learning. 
which is mandatory at their school. Um, that's been, you know, some heavy stuff with third grade. You wouldn't think so, but, you know, the common core math that we didn't grow up with, I'm now trying to learn and help my son with, and it's frustrating. So the one day he said, let, let me do that, you know, so you can have a break. So we've really had to work as a team to get through this. And like I said, our kids have been surprisingly very understanding. They don't really even ask about the park anymore. They, we asked them a couple of questions about the virus. My sister actually created a YouTube video asking children their thoughts on the virus and their responses. And we were blown away by, like, they listened to us, you know, when we're having conversation and they're quite knowledgeable, knowledgeable about it. Mm. And they take it seriously like we do. Um, I'm glad to hear you mentioned backyard. I was going to ask you if your apartment was up high, if you had any place to go outside, if you were allowed to go in your own backyard. I, I was under the impression, actually, that the restrictions might even forbid that. So what are the rules we right do, now? We do have a small front and backyard, small, so our kids can't run back and forth. You know, it's, it's very small, but, um, you know, my friends down in Naples don't have that. They are in a high rise, and th their kids are playing on the balcony, and that's it, you know? so This is a triplex. Yeah, uh, but we're, we in a, in. we're in a condo, so, you know, there's no one above us or below us. Are there, right. a lot, are there a lot of other military families in your complex that are dealing there's, with the same thing? Um, there's no base housing here, so we're all pretty spread out within different Italian villages. So we are living among, you know, our lovely Italian neighbors. And um, you'll, you'll hear when we were back when we were allowed to go to the park um, here and there, some other Engl English-speaking folks that we could obviously associate with the base. So we run into them occasionally as well. Not right now, you know, right. we're in the house, but... Yeah, they're all dealing with the same stuff that we are. And Craig, are you still being expected to serve? Are you called in? Are you are you active? Yes, I am. So um, there are some times where I go in. There's other times where I telework. It just depends on the situation. We have seen some amazing scenes, both of despair and of inspiration, that have come from Italy in the last few weeks. And we'll talk more about that as we continue in our conversation with Sarah and Craig Farner. After this, on The Big Impact. We are heading down the home stretch of our conversation with Sarah and Craig Farner, and uh, social media is, is a remarkable animal, both for better and for worse. We wouldn't be connecting today were it not for the invention of Skype. Uh, True. Many right. people around the world would be losing contact with family members if it weren't for things like FaceTime and Zoom and Skype. So it's, a, it's an awesome world of technology. Social media has its ups and downs. But these days when everybody has so much time on their hands, um, I think that, that social media is getting quite a workout. And from Italy, we are seeing things that are just really troubling at times, the scenes from hospitals and government officials yelling at the people and all that. And then we're seeing these amazing scenes of inspiration. And we get them because somebody um, on a balcony holds up a phone and there's an entire courtyard of people who are singing together or maybe uh, somehow in, in praise and in, in, in encouragement of, of medical personnel, they're doing some powerful things. I love those moments. You guys are living them. What are the positives? What are the encouraging things that you've gotten to witness while you've been in the middle of it all there in Italy? Personally, for me, I haven't left the house since the uh, end of February. He's done the grocery shopping, so I'm not seeing a whole lot. I haven't driven around since then, but even from our, our upstairs balcony, I saw it, um, on this big pole over someone's roof, a big Italian flag that was put up, just flapping in the wind, magnificent. That was really cool, and it came up just during during this um, terrible time. So something as small as that was just so cool to see with the mountains behind it, a sign of hope. And also there's the Italian slogan, Andra Tutte Bene, which means in English, everything will be okay. And it's went viral. So basically what people are doing, their kids are painting banners or whatever supplies they have at home, poster board. We did a piece of construction paper and made a rainbow with a saying, and then you post it somewhere in your yard. So we can actually see a big banner across the street that we get to look at every day and be reminded that, you know, it, it's going to be okay. And like he talked about the unity, you know, just not even talking to someone, I can see that unity out my front porch. Right. And with social media uh, and instant translation, like we're on some of our local Italian Facebook pages 
uh, and we got to see a number of things from them. So there was a while where every couple of days somebody would post, hey, today at 9 p.m., everyone get a flashlight on them and flash the light outside <laughs> as, as a thing of unity. Or at 7 p.m., you know, take your radio outside and play the Italian national anthem. Yeah. And so they're all finding ways in the community on, on how to show that unity without actually having to be close to each other. For sure. Sarah mentioned, Craig, that, that you've been the one going out to, to get groceries and things like that. So how bizarre is it to see empty streets and a ghost town everywhere you go? Oh, it's, it's definitely different. Um, some days you don't barely see anything. Other days you see a little bit. Obviously, people are still... Um, out for you know essential services people have to get their groceries uh, but you can't leave your city so if you have a small grocery oh. store in your city that's the only place you can go right. you can't go to the next city to go grocery shopping mm -hmm. you can't go to the next city to do anything unless there's a need like hey wow. this doctor that i need to see is in this city only then you'll be able to leave and the fines are hefty <clears throat> if you break that you up to three thousand euro fine are there military checkpoints how are they determining if i'm going from you know detroit to ann arbor Right. So, yes, there are checkpoints all over the place, inner region, you know, along, you know, the main thoroughfares. And they, they stop you when, when they set up a checkpoint. They stop every single person. And that's where you say, hey, I'm this person. I live here. I'm going here for these reasons. And, you know, around here, obviously, you see a, a member in uniform and you're right outside the base gate saying, I got to go to work. Easy enough. OK, I see you going to the gate. You need to go. Um, otherwise, you know, again, filling out that piece of paper. Uh, but it's been interesting, especially getting to see all the different you know, houses, like she said, with the Italian flag, with their Andre Tutto Bene slogans out there. Uh, it, it's all over the place. Wow. Um, yeah. So they're, they're obviously not messing around with all this. Is it no, working? No, not at all. Is it making a difference? It is. it is. The numbers of new cases are going down. They went down by over 1,000. Uh, last night, compared to the prior 24 hours, the deaths are still staying there, but that's going to take a bit, we think. Right. You're going ex to expect to see that because the number of new cases are going to decline before um, the folks that are, are passing away from it. So we've seen about five days where it's either stagnated or recently went down. Uh, so that is a really good sign. But, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. Hmm. It's going to take – it's going to be quite a while uh, before – they're going to start releasing some of those restrictions. And it does you no good to say to one of the one of the guards, hey, I'm in the Air Force. They don't care if you're in the Air Force. They don't care who you are, right? The rules are the rules. And, Correct. Um, and for you as a family unit, if, for instance, tomorrow the restrictions were lifted in Italy, would you be on a plane back to America or would you just resume life and duty right where you are? Life and duty right here. We're not going anywhere. Yep, for sure. In fact, if they did something like that, we probably still wouldn't go out right, right. away. You know, when the data and everything makes sense uh, and it seems like everything is fairly safe, then, you know, we start to, to venture out a little bit. Yeah, we have our discussion as a family. Even like he said before the main lockdown on the 9th, we decided as a family a couple weeks prior that the kids and I would just stay put, you know, near the house. And we've been, you know, pretty fortunate here. Uh, you know, we have all the groceries we need. We have most everything minus sanitizer, which, you know, like nobody is getting uh, around the world. Uh, but the base has been great. Uh, the local Italian leadership, uh, you know, the presidents, prime ministers, all those folks, you know, working together uh, to do this in unity. It's, it's, been, it's been really good to see. Yeah, it's been impressive. Way back at the beginning of our conversation, uh, you both mentioned how important uh, your faith was in, in bringing the two of you together. And we love talking about that on this program. Um, in fact, in difficult times like these, one of my recurring prayers is that it will cause people to really take some time to contemplate their standing before Almighty God and, and, and really to do some serious internal investigation to see if my vertical, I call it the vertical relationship, is in, in the place it's supposed to be. Um, I'm not, not talking about the big guy upstairs generic kind of a thing. I'm talking about the relationship with the one who made you and can sustain you through all of these difficult times. How has your faith played a role in helping you deal with uh, uh, an unprecedented situation in Italy? It's 
been it's been great because I suffer from anxiety, but during all of this, I've kept my faith in God and I have a peace that I haven't felt with any other situation. I just have a peace in my heart that we're going to be okay. The kids are going to be okay. And that's the reason we created our Facebook page is to reach out and check on others because we're doing great. And I know 100% that's from God in my faith. I've never felt a peace like I do right now. I'm not afraid. Hmm. And it, it's been huge. It keeps you positive, right? Yeah. Uh, spiritual resiliency. Uh, and it's huge, especially in times like this where, where your world is changing and you're not in control of everything anymore. And realistically, you know, that's kind of the whole point sometimes is that you aren't always in control. And, and having that relationship uh, with faith uh, and being able to give that, you know, to God, hey, I trust you, you know, this is in your control, uh, definitely helps. And we can focus on others now that, you know, we're, we're calm we're at peace and we can help other people out and that's our goal that's why we're doing this I, i've um, i've been reminded of the scripture that talks about worry and how worrying doesn't add one day to your life or one hair to yeah. your head and i've said to a number yeah. of people if worrying could add a hair to your head i would have tried it years ago <laughs> It's, it's obviously it's not going to work very well uh, but at the same time we have this um we have a culture that is so accustomed, and I'm speaking, of course, to the American culture, that's so accustomed to rapid delivery of our desires, whatever the desires are. But call, if, if the Uber Eats delivery guy is, is seven minutes later than the app shows me, then I want my meal for free. That's kind of how we are, right? right? If, if, the microwave is, yeah. if the microwave used to take 18 seconds to make the thing and now it takes 42 seconds, I need a new microwave. Like, it's clearly there's something wrong with it. And so right. through all of this, what what is often being viewed as oppression, I'm really trying to encourage people to, to view this as an opportunity. It's, yeah. it's sure. a kind of a reset button chance for so many people to put the priorities in their lives kind of back in the right order and right. hopefully to keep them there. Um, is it is that is that thought process just limited to um, to old guys like me? Or are you able to have that conversation with your kids even on on what really matters? Yeah, we've had lots of sure. lots of extra time to talk to each other and talk to them and share thoughts. So yeah, no, it's not just you. And again, like you said, using that time wisely. Uh, if you don't have to be at work all the time. And you get more time to spend with your family and invest in your family. Like, you got to take advantage of it, right? Don't mope around. It's time that you can spend with your kids building those forts, reading books, um, talking about things, right? Things that you miss out by having to work uh, all the time for a living. Now, if you have that opportunity, I would say take it as a blessing. Mm -hmm. Well, so many of us have had forever this list of, if I only had time, I'd take care of this, I'd do this. Yeah. Well, I got to think this is a hand delivered on a silver platter uh, helping yeah, of time, are. whether you wanted it or not. And at the, yeah. at the other end of this, and I, I firmly believe there will be another end of this, this, this too shall pass. Man, yeah. I would hate to think that I had spent however long this is wasting time watching Netflix or, or just, just wasting time, I guess, because uh, everybody has their own, maybe it's just, Maybe it's just scouring social media and all of a sudden four hours have passed. We, we can do better than that. And, yeah, um, for and sure. you guys are presented with that opportunity almost forcefully more so than we are here. Um, I can still, I can run to the store if I need to, and I don't have to take any paperwork with me to support my endeavors. Yeah. Uh, out behind my house, there's a large field where I can go hit golf balls if I, if I really uh, want to and nobody's nice. going to come and taser me. Um, so, you know, we have a little bit more freedom, but for what you guys are, are dealing with, um, have you found that turning off the news is important? Uh, have you, have you done that? Because in Italy, I would have to think the news is just a constant bombardment of, of, of dire predictions these days. Lucky for us, the news here is an Italian, so we have to oh. take the time to yeah. find the, the articles on Facebook and translate them you know, if we feel it's something we want to look into. But yeah, I've stepped away from 
um, the news in America quite a bit besides um, keeping up on the facts to share when we do go, we go live on our Facebook page. So yeah. um, he's a little more into researching and numbers than I am. So he probably spends more than, you know, more time than I do with that. But have, have you sure. guys, do you have food delivery services? Is there Uber Eats? Is there Grubhub kind of a thing in Italy? No, there are some pizzerias in town that were de- still allowed to deliver. Are they still delivering pizza? Yeah, they're still delivering pe- uh, pizza and, and other restaurants. And there have been a lot of different volunteers. I can't remember how many thousands it was um, that have banded together uh, to bring groceries to kind of the more frail, you yeah. know, uh, some of the elderly folks that may have some pre-existing conditions and taking it to their doorstep uh, so that they don't have to go out. So the country as a whole has done a tremendous job here uh, helping its own people. Yeah. How much better is Italian pizza in Italy than it is in America? I've never been to Italy. <laughs> it depends on the pizzeria. It depends on the type of pizza, but it is definitely different. Uh, and most of the time, and not, it, is, it is amazing. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. We have a couple of local pizzerias here that are just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And if you want deep dish pizza, this isn't the place to get it. So that's why I say <laughs> it depends on the type of pizza you like, right? You know, the Neapolitan-style pizza is going to be primo. I just want my meat lovers. That's all I'm asking for. I just don't know if that's possible. That's there you go. Saying. There you go. Hey, I can't thank you two enough for uh, letting us inside your world there in Italy. Um, and sure. again, as a reminder, for those of you who are listening to us on the radio and listening to us in podcast form, this is the first time in the history of the Big Impact that we've also recorded the video of our conversation And so if you'll go to our uh, website at BigImpactRadio.com, you'll be able to see Sarah and Craig. um, And if you ever want to see what behind the scenes looks like as we put a podcast together, we're kind of shooting all of that here at the same time because we have so much time on our hands. So, (laughs) (laughs) hey, Lord bless you guys. Keep you safe. And uh, we can't wait till you get back to Michigan. And as as more things develop over there, I really hope you'll keep us kind of in the loop, stay in touch. And Sarah, as we close, uh, could you let everybody know where your Facebook page is so if they want to follow your story, they can do so? Yes, we can be found at Military Life World of Travelers on Facebook. Military Life World of Travelers. Yes, sir. All right, good. Great. Hug those kids. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. you Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.